Mark Watts, EliteFDS.com. I'm here on the campus of Urbana University, and this is part of our Sports Performance Coach Education Series. We're going to talk about more work and less time, and as a strength and conditioning coach, how you can get your athletes to improve that training session density. And there's two advantages to this. Number one, obviously, you're in a situation where you don't have enough equipment, enough space, and enough time slots to fit all of your athletes. And you have too many athletes to train in the amount of space that you have. That's pretty common among strength coaches at the college and the high school levels. Uh, and even, you know, there are some situations where you have uh, some of the larger universities where they don't have that issue. But by and large, this is something that, you know, strength coaches are going to have to tackle uh, this issue. Uh, secondly, it gets our athletes in an, a situation where they're getting more work done, they're more engaged with the workout. The one thing that you have to try to avoid at all costs is downtime in those periods where the athletes don't have anything to do. Uh, number one, when the sport coach sees that, sport coaches relate you know, different things to uh, success. You know, for us as strength coaches, we feel that if an athlete has adequate time to rest in between maximal sets or dynamic effort sets or Olympic uh, lifting technique, uh, you know, that's one thing that we know that is important. But for some sport coaches, a lot of times they associate that with not working very hard. Whether they're right or wrong, it's in the situation you're in. So can we get the most out of our workouts by getting those athletes more engaged in what they're doing? So hopefully today I can give you a couple pointers to help you out with this. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, basically five different things uh, that will enable you as a strength and conditioning coach to get your athletes uh, actively engaged in a better process within your training session. So the five things we're gonna talk about is number one, a dumbbell kettlebell setup that again, these are things that I've used in the past. Uh, if you have a better idea, obviously this is what these are for to, to, to encourage some dialogue with that. But this is something that really helped. And most of these that we came up with was either because it was someone else's idea that we stole or because we messed it up uh, to the point where we said, listen, we got to make a change. And that's really, you know, that really has, uh, has, was the birth of a lot of these ideas that hopefully can help you in your situation. Um, rack assignments uh, and rotations, that's something that, that, that I've talked about in the past. Um, and again, uh, three things with speed stuff, competitive speed, speed groups for linear speed, and then two, agility uh, training uh, modifications that we made in the past as well. So hopefully that'll those will help you. So uh, let's go through with the kettlebell and dumbbell setup. Now here's the issue, here's the problem. Uh, most weight rooms are set up in a sense that the dumbbells or kettlebells are all in one section. So we have racks spread out all across the weight room where we have individual, uh, individuals and small groups assigned to each one of these racks, but when it comes down to dumbbell time, they all have to go in the same area. Now I've been, been able to see a couple large weight rooms where their dumbbell area was big enough they could fit a whole team. Um, or they've been in a situation where all the dumbbells, you have racks on each side of the rooms and the dumbbells are down the middle. Uh, very good setup that way. Or you even have it in a situation where you have small dumbbell uh, you know, racks uh, with, associated with each platform. But for most situations, that's not the case. So one thing that we felt that was important for us was to get our dumbbells in a space that was more easily used. Uh, I think there are so many times where we have an athlete, again, if you have uh, two full sets of dumbbells, that still only gives you, you know, two sets of each and maybe four of the same dumbbell at once. So one thing that we would be frustrated with was any time we'd hear athletes, you know, who has a 25? Do you have a, do you have a 20? Who has a 20? And it just, they're, they're just searching for these dumbbells. They never get put back. And then you have a big log jam trying to get the dumbbells out of the rack. So what we did, we'd set the dumbbells anywhere about 10 feet apart, maybe a little less and just set them in a line. So again, from uh, lowest weight, from 25s all the way up until, you know, whatever it was. And again, depending on the team, depending on the athlete, depending on the exercise. So we have those set up uh, in a linear fashion and then basically had the athletes would have their weights on their workout sheets so they would know exactly what uh, weight they needed for each subsequent set. So if it's, I have to start off with a 25, I would get a line behind the 25-pound the uh, dumbbell or the, you know, the, 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 the 
whatever the the 36 pound kettlebell whatever it may be uh, so they would it, be in a situation where they could just line up behind execute their movement now one thing we did that helped is that every single exercise we did with dumbbells was with one arm and the reason we did that was not just because of yes of course you get some kind of it's a unilateral movement so you get some kind of stabilization uh, obviously that you know the left hip is you know really associated with the right shoulder and um, but there was another thing was uh, not just not just the training benefits but also the safety benefits if I'm doing something overhead if I'm doing a dumbbell snatch uh, I have that other hand there and I can rotate myself out of harm's way as opposed to unless you're taking the time to get the athletes to learn how to drop out of a snatch for example uh, so it helped with safety but really the number one thing is that we were able to get more work done in less time and this is the, the analogy I go with if we have four athletes and they have a set of 50 pound dumbbells well if I'm doing an exercise with the 50s I have athlete A going athlete B athlete C athlete D so that's a one to three ratio from worth work to rest now if I could go ahead and give two of the athletes a 50 and the other two athletes a 50, now I have more of a one-to-one -one ratio. And even if I'm doing some explosive movements, really that, you know, if, if they were going at a moderate pace, that still was manageable. And now it didn't save on time because they had to do, obviously, double the sets because they're doing one arm at a time. But what it did was it kept the athletes more engaged. There was less downtime in between. So we ended up doing one dumbbell at a time. So we had our basically, sometimes we'd have an entire workout with just the dumbbells. Sometimes it would just be part of it. But we try to set up in that linear fashion, whether it be kettlebells or dumbbells. So, um, you know, obviously we would just put them either outside the weight room or along, uh, along the track, whatever it may be, just to give us some more space. Uh, and maybe that can be applicable for your situation. Uh, the next thing that we, that we talked about was, again, some of these, these strategies would be um, and this is for any time we're, 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 we're doing a training session where we're in the racks or platforms so these strategies would be uh, doing things in between sets and the way we'd set it up was either we would do mobility or prehab in between sets maybe flexibility ankle mobility in between uh, you know Olympic sets something along that lines uh, also uh, doing some complex training doing some of our explosive movements after a heavy movement um, one of the things that was frustrating a lot of times anytime you have a, a, a medicine ball drill or a plyo boxes again you're limited on how many plyo boxes you might be able to have in your facility uh, not just because of the cost but also because of storage so we would want to set up plyo boxes, whether they're, you know, whatever random sizes, uh, along with those racks so that athletes can engage in, in some kind of a, a movement after their actual heavy set. Uh, and another thing was just to match up an antagonist movement uh, with whatever main set we have. So again, those are just some ideas, and I'll go a little more specifics uh, with those. Um, so the rack assignments, and this is one thing that really helped us, and I talked about this previously, is uh, just having, making sure that you know, again, how many athletes you have, how many racks you have, and how to incorporate those small groups within those racks. We spent a little bit more time at the beginning of the session to match up those athletes, sometimes by height. If you're doing, you know, whether it's, whether it's a squat, an overhead, or a bench press, sometimes that would alleviate some, some, some issues because, again, you wouldn't have to really adjust uh, the, those J-hooks. The other thing would be just to make sure that you have all those workout sheets that you have, their training cards, and, and really put groups that were similar weight all together. So again, uh, the disadvantage is you got all your strongest guys all in one group, and maybe you want to have some of your stronger guys to bring up some of those guys that are a little bit behind, you know, depending on, on their strength levels. Uh, but uh, from a logistic standpoint, it really helped the workout go uh, much, much, much faster because there's just less changing weights. Uh, and so any time that we would have per rack, I would much rather do athletes, all the athletes on one rack. I'd rather have you know seven, eight athletes on a rack and, be, and, and incorporate complexes than to split up that team. Because again, I, if, if you have an exercise in a specific order, you want the athletes to follow that order. So uh, this is just a, a, a guideline that we use. This, some of this we, we got off of uh, Evan Simon at, at Oregon State. And really, if we had four athletes, excuse me, if we had four athletes, again, uh, we would have a spot. Again, we'll use the squat as an example, but it'd be basically you're either spotting, squatting, loading, uh, and then you would, you know, again, you have two loaders and you really wouldn't have any kind of prehab or extra 
extra exercise in there. If we had have five athletes, we incorporate some kind of a, a plyometric ballistic type movement, some kind of, uh, you know, again, a lot of talk about post-activation potentiation type training. Um, Secondly, again, we would also incorporate, if we had six athletes, incorporate a prehab, uh, incorporate an antagonist, and so on and so forth, so they have a pattern. So here's how it looks, what it looks like. Um, if we'd have a rack assignment, so we'll just go from basically, if you're looking at athlete A through F, uh, for this example, really what happens is, again, the order you would follow would be, again, you would be in the rack, and then you would, you would spot. Once you would spot, you would, you would be the next one in the line. So really what happens is our loaders will be loading those, uh, those, that rack, the bar. They would, like a NASCAR pit crew. Uh, this is a terminology I like to, like, like to, 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 to compare it with. And, and really, it, you know, they're just, all they're doing is waiting for the next lifter to say, I need this on the bar, and they would take care of it. So that lifter got his hands on the bar, or he's on the bench laying, he's waiting, the bar's loaded, and they're ready to go, okay? Um, and then they would rotate from there. So again, what happens is, for, for an example, and this will be more clear once we go to the next slide. So again, once that athlete, athlete A would squat, as soon as he's done squatting, he would do some box jumps, right? Uh, athlete B will be now on the rack. Now these spotters and loaders, we would, you, you, can, you can rotate sides if you want to or keep on the same side. That's not, that, uh, kids will figure it out as soon as they go through once. But just knowing that I know who I follow. So I know that I follow this athlete, so I have to spot him. And that'll keep everything. As soon as I'm done spotting, I'm getting in the rack. And I go from whatever it may be. I go from lifting to some kind of a, 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 a speed or explosive movement, to some kind of maybe a prehab or flexibility or, or some kind of antagonistic movement. Some people, I got this from Toby Jacoby, would want to do, for example, band TKEs in between bench sets just to get that added. Or, and some, some athletes want to maybe say, no, I'm going to do some face pulls uh, to you know, activate the antagonist muscles for that particular exercise. That's up to you. That's up to your training philosophy. So that's one way to, way to kind of think about that. Um, Moving on to speed training, uh, you know, really it's one of those, you have non-track athletes, so you really have a limited amount of time and how much you're going to be able to, to, to run with them. So I'll give you three different drills uh, that we'll do. The first is going to be a linear speed, and again, the way we'd set this up, uh, and again, hearing this from a lot of people, about 10% would be really on the mechanics, uh, and that's a, that's a topic for a different lecture, and really the number one thing we did um, if we did resisted starts, we would make sure they were at a short distance, make sure that the weight was applicable so it didn't inhibit the actual, uh, you know, the, the mechanics of the sprint, and we would follow it up with some kind of a sprint with that, that was unweighted, so we would do, have that contrast involved. And that was probably about 10%. So really the most effective thing that we've done uh, was to get athletes in these competitive speed groups. And we've seen this example from uh, John Sisk back when he was with Vanderbilt and also uh, Pat Ivey when, uh, at Missouri. And a lot of these schools are doing these speed drills. We would keep it to three, and I'll show you how we do it. So with these competitive speed drills, we'd have our athletes set up, right? So again, here's our three athletes, and they would be set up. So really what we want is the coach would be on the opposite side of there's our first place athlete. This is our fastest athlete. Uh, and then we we just set them up in line. So you can do that by position. You could do that by uh, by sport if you're doing multiple sports. So again, this might be all of your um, all of your midfielders, and this could be all of your attackmen and all of your defensemen and lines going through. So basically, what happens is once they race through, once they come through and they race, and again, you can set this up by different starts positions, you know, push-up starts, lean, you know, kneeling starts are tough to do competitive, or uh, uh, leaning starts, uh, falling starts, tough to do competitive nature, but anytime you do any kind of, you know, push-up starts, scramble starts, kneeling, whatever it may be, lateral starts, you can do it competitively. And so once we go through, if those athletes would finish through, so say they race, they're going to do for week one, you're only doing 20s. You don't want to, again, you're not ready to do 40s at that time during your off-season uh, cycle. They would say they would finish through, and athlete two would be first, uh, athlete three would be second, athlete one would be third. Basically, that coach would either yell out two, three, one. Um, if you have a bigger group, you might have to film it. Maybe you take the average of these, but if you're going to do it by, by, uh, race by race basis, you want to make sure that, again, the athletes know who's won. And they'll, they'll have an idea. So all of a sudden, the coach would just really uh, you know, yell out those numbers. So again, when they would get back in their competitive lines, 
Now they would be set up. So again, athlete two, remember, he's in that, he's in that first place position, right? He's in that first place position. Athlete two now is in what we call uh, the pole position. Athlete three will be second. There's the loser of that particular race, right? We're in a society we have to have winners and losers. Um, but really, uh, competitiveness is something that all sport coaches are trying to get their teams to do, you know, get their athletes to compete on a daily basis. Uh, I don't know any coach that says that they don't think that that has a carry over to the season. Now, uh, you know, making sure you know, I don't know if you have to have your athletes beat the crap out of each other on, on, in the offseason, but just to get them to compete is really important, obviously. Um, you know, most coaches feel that way. So that is the next, next time they race. So again, they'll just repeat that however many, however many sets that you have uh, within, that, you know, within that process. Uh, so the other part would be, again, that was a leapfrog technique. Now what you can also do is either at the end of the session, uh, we would just have an intern write down where they place at the end of that session. They would know when the last race was uh, a lot of times. Sometimes they didn't. Uh, for, you know, sometimes they want a sandbag, so you have to be careful with that. But again, for most athletes, they're going to be competitive to win every race. Uh, and then you're reinforcing that them running full speed is the a, is a, is a best component to really develop speed. So now at the end of maybe, say, every other sprint or every session, or every week, whatever it may be, now at the end of this, now they'll go ahead and leapfrog. So, so what happens is, so if I'm third place in this line, I get bumped down to this line. So these two would switch, right? Second place stays the same. If you got first place, you move up to the next line. Third place, you move back down to the next line. So now they're competing with a different set of athletes, and it changes it up. Now you have those athletes. Maybe you have a linebacker that's as fast as some of your receivers. He's able to move up and really push those guys. So you're getting the fastest athletes. Now what that does, it helps you determine who consistently who competes and who is really your fastest athletes without a stopwatch. It's hard to really gauge improvement, but you can you can at least know you know where athletes are in comparison to each other. Uh, the other thing it does is it's easy. To, to incorporate your training modality within this competitive groups. You, it's, it's easy really to uh, just time when that first athlete, when that first group, group finish, hit the timer, right? We would use basically a version of Charlie Francis, which, you know, again, you know, if a, if a sprint takes five, five seconds, uh, you should rest five minutes. Well, we're not track athletes, and that might be a little bit extreme. Uh, I would never go against that, you know, but for our situation, we really did, we really had to. So about two and a half minutes rest, and then you, you can at least gauge, hey, we might be going a little bit fast. Again, if your athletes aren't recovering between sprints, you're just conditioning, and you're not really working on speed. That's just my opinion. So you can really gauge as far as with the stopwatch, their rest intervals. All right, so moving on, let's look at agility training. We split this up, and this is someone from Jimmy Radcliffe, split up between uh, basically speed cuts and power cuts. So speed cuts is really when you're you know, some kind of a cone drill, where you're actually uh, you know, lowering that center of gravity, getting that head turned, and, and running around an object. Think of the, the, you know, a three cone drill would be the three cone L drill. You know, the second two turns are really speed cuts. The first two are power cuts. Power cuts is more similar to a 5-10-5. You're stopping, planning, pushing off, and going the other direction. So uh, these were the things that we would do. So I'll talk to you in detail about how we set up our four cone drill um, and we set up and how we did some of our incorporate our deceleration methods with our agility shuttle. So let's talk about the four cone drill first. With the four cone drill, the way we'd set up is again every five yards apart, we'd have these cones. So they'd be really five by five, five by five squares. So now you can have a, and again, a long uh, field that uh, on, on basically on a sideline and just basically mark off five yards. So really what happens is this is pretty universal and usually it's pretty easy to set up. So what happens is make sure when you set this up that you don't have athletes on this last set of cones right here. All right, because again, this will eliminate some of the drills you're able to do. So we would just leave one set of cones open and really would execute these four cone drills. Now, as far as coaching, we would just try to make sure that the athletes, uh, again, full speed to that cone, make sure they lower the center of gravity, speed their feet, 
get their head turned to the next cone they want to go and make sure that you're explaining every single time. And a lot of these drills, these athletes can still compete depending on how they finish, which cone they finish with. So that's important to do with your drill setup. So uh, for an example, this is a, an idea of, a, of a, an end drill um, or you know, obviously a reverse end. So again, the athlete would just start coming around the cone down and then finish through the opposite cone. So really what happens is you know, these athletes will finish on this cone. I start on this, I finish here. And now you can, as a coach, you can really see and they can still compete and see who that winner is every single time. Make sure again, anytime you're doing a drill where they're going back to this direction, back to this area, make sure that next group does not step up to the line because again, you have some kind of collision. Right, as soon as the whistle blows, they want to step up, they're ready to go. Make sure they understand to stay off that line. Um, some, like an L drill, doesn't really matter. They're finishing through the same spot. Make sure, again, if you have the athletes you know, you know, lined up on a certain cone, where do you want the line to be? Do you want it to be on the same side or you want it to be on the opposite side, depending on how they finish? Right? So if you're doing just a basic triangle drill or just basically an A drill, uh, just knowing where that athlete's finishing can help out and alleviate a lot of uh, you know, so, some issues and collisions and you're not going to get frustrated as a coach if, if, you, if it runs smoothly. All right, so um, the next time, again, once you want to go the opposite direction, depending on where they're at, if they're finishing on the same side of the cone, now you just shift everybody down one line. Now you can do all those drills to the opposite direction. So it's really easy because again, now you just have the, now you have that opposite end cones open. So it was easy. It, I'll have a list of drills at the end, but it really was one of those uh, easy uh, setups and you can get more athletes working at one time. So again, think about how many drill, how many cones you can set up uh, a long ways on a, on a short area of a track. Again, you could just maybe use a tr an indoor track and still get a lot of these drills done. All right, so let's move on to uh, power cuts or the two change of direction drills that we did. The first one would be uh, a, a ladder shuttle. So what happens is a lot of times is we would always want to make sure that we had some drills set up so the athlete finishes in the opposite direction where they start. And here's what I mean. So for an example, um, a lot of times we have a 5-10-5, we have an athlete where they go you know, five yards and back or 10 yards and back and they will be finishing through the same area. What we wanted to do is if we had somewhere, you know, anywhere between 70, 100 athletes at once, there's going to be a lot of athletes uh, waiting. And again, we talked about that downtime. We want to keep those athletes engaged. So again, for an example, this will be an example of a 10-5-10. Uh, a now, they still get two power cuts. Uh, it's not exactly training for this specific combine test, but really, you're doing a closed drill to help them be better athletes. Uh, and, and have, hopefully that has a carryover to the field or court. If it doesn't, don't do it. So let's run 10 yards, back five, and then finish through 10. So you'd always have a co you know, you always have an athlete or a, or a coach to making sure they're finishing through. Um, with this, I think a lot of times what you can do is same basic principle. Make sure when that, when that first group of athletes finishes, you hit the timer, and now you can calculate their rest intervals. The good thing you can do with a very, very big group is if it goes five, or I'm sorry, 10, back five, now you can start this next group. So again, 10, five, and then you could say go. Well, these athletes are finishing through 10. These athletes are already started to do their first 10. So what happens is they can overlap. As soon as those athletes get back to the first line, boom, you can start the next group. And then you can calculate, okay, this is we're a little bit ahead, or hey, we need to give them a little bit, a little bit of rest. So, Either way, that's one of those things. Now, all of a sudden, now they can just jog back to the opposite line. They're active. They're actively recovering, uh, and they're ready to go the next, the next time. So that was something that really helped us just get more athletes competing uh, through, through the drills. Now, initially, if you want to start off with some deceleration type training, uh, instead of, and again, I would suggest look at uh, Parisi Speed School. Martin Rooney did an excellent job with that deceleration. But what we started to do was the same basic drills, only we would always start them a lateral start. That's number one, right? You can start them any way you want to. But this was the day we started laterally mostly, uh, either from a knee or standing. And what happens is you can have them for the first part, you can have them shuffle, plant, and stop. So they can just stop right where they are. And now you can check their change of direction mechanics. You can check to see if they have that weight distributed on, on the leg they need to go to, their foot positioning, posture, everything. So again, really what you have is you can have them shuffle, plant, 
and then sprint. Or you can have them go ahead and sprint and stop. So what happens is the drills are the same, but now you're just telling them where they need to freeze. So now you're just giving them multiple whistles. Start with a shuffle, then do a sprint. Make sure you separate those different sprints with a whistle so you can check that posture and your coaching staff can do the same thing. And then you can incorporate some more, uh, some more of the high speed stuff as you go, as you go through, okay? So it's, it's one of those things you can incorporate that deceleration stuff. Um, with a pro agility shuttle, what we figured out was um, you really need, you know, again, if this is 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 yards, you can get three groups. Now, the problem with this is you have to allot some time for these athletes to get back in line. So if I have three to five to seven, however many athletes you can fit on this line, and I'm going to have to, once they finish, I'm going to have to give that next group some, some time to finish through. So when this group finishes through, if they're going to go ahead five, ten, five, this group is finishing through as they finish in through the line, this next group coming up. So it could be a little more hectic. I would suggest this with smaller groups. It is one of those situations where, for me, uh, if, you, if you really wanted to get them to do five yards first, you can do the other, other set, the ladder style uh, drills. With this, you know, you have a couple of issues. And again, if you have any athlete going the wrong direction, you can have an issue. Plus, some of those athletes, again, when you're coaching them up, you can you know, you, you, they're, they're spread out a little bit more. It's harder to get them attention. I think the other way, once they finish, say they finish the first drill, they're at the other end. Now you can come down, hey, we're a little ahead of schedule. Let me give them a couple, a couple coaching tips. You got that whole team together. So that's why I like the first version a little better. That's, and then again, there are some issues with this. Not wrong, is just make sure you're, you're set up properly uh, to, to deal with some of these issues that might come up. Uh, and again, this is, a, this is a list of just some of the drills you can do. Uh, I wish I had some videos on these. We're working on that. But really with the, with the four cones, we went from everything from that, 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 that figure eight to triangle L. Uh, the th you can actually do a three cone. You can do the A. You know, I I, the example I showed was the N and the reverse N. Uh, so, and again, you can add a shuffle to any of those. You can add a back pedal, a U drill. You can be very creative. But again, you always have an athlete. You know, they're always going to start one one end. And again, if they finish at the other cone, then you're ready to just really easy to set up so you can do the next next drill. Uh, they're already shifted down one cone. Uh, and then again, for the um, for the ladder shuffles. Again, these are just a list of you know what the volume would be. So now you can calculate volume. If you're one of those guys like for us, you know we wanted to stick around you know 200 to 400 yards. 200 yards is really pretty good, depending on the time of season, depending on where you're at in your training cycle. You can really calculate that. So again, it just depends on it's just a different parameter setup. So instead of starting with you know you go five five five, if you want you go all the way to where you have almost a forty yard shuttle where you're going fifteen ten fifteen, and you know for for later on in that training cycle. So you could do all those drills. So that's for the ladder shuffle type, and again you're back to the start line uh, on the other e opposite end, and then your four cone drills too. So again, those are the five things: how you set up your dumbbells, how to set up your uh, um, you, you know, the, the rack assignments and how they rotate all the way to really the, 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 the speed, the competitive speed groups, which is really just anytime you get athletes to compete, it's, it's just hugely important to get for their development. Um, and again, those two types of, 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 of agility drills, one being the four cone for speed cuts and one being the, uh, the ladder shuffle for power cuts. And again, anytime you can get those, I mean, go old school and just the best thing you do with two people is get them together and have them race. I know right now we're in these competitive drills. We want to have them wrestling with towels and sticks and everything else. Um, really, if you're talking about sports, but to line them up and have them race in front of all their teammates might be one of the best things you can do to get them on the spot and to really encourage athletes. You know, it's just like anything else that you do in a weight room. Again, any questions that you have on this? And again, it's been a couple of years since, since I've been in it. Guys that have been in the game a little bit, again, share some of your ideas, what really helped you get your athletes getting more work done at a high level in less time. And let's share some of those ideas back and forth and let's, uh, let's, let's get our athletes better uh, with some smart training and, 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 some, and some passionate uh, work ethics. So questions, again, leadfds.com backslash categories backslash education uh, will be where all our articles are. So again, hit us up. All your strength and conditioning needs, uh, everything from racks to prowlers to specialty bars, we got it. Make sure you hit us up.